for a drink? Um, I've got money for them. Have you got money for them? Um, they can get a drink. Well, what do you want then, Joe? A can. Yeah, I will get them one. Oh. Sid from the village of Adwarton Moor, which makes them ahead of Parliament. Much larger forces than anticipated. The whole village is occupied by a large force. You did get the horses, I hope. No. So the scouting parties of the forlorn hope, taken very much by surprise. Now we're trying to withdraw very quickly to the top of the hill. And that wasn't all the horses. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can hear, Barish is actually down with the forlorn hope. And uh, they've now got to climb the hill, so she will try and give you commentary, but um, the moment, it's fairly exhausted work climbing up that hill. You try and look out for her, she's actually got a green sash on, the commentators wear a green sash. Good time to talk to you about sashes. Well, Royalists good. in general wore a blue sash, and parliamentarians in general wore an orange sash. But there were occasions when there were different coloured sashes, meaning different coloured things. But, if they're wearing a red or burnt orange coloured sash, you can assume that they were probably Parliament. Who were the wenches on the battlefield? Who were the wenches on the battlefield? Oh, they got what? Yeah, they got the bag on. So they get a tie. Yeah. But in, in the old day times, it couldn't be. Why are you missing it all in I'm not. <coughs> So we now can see the mast, muskets and uh, some pipes from the Parliament Army forming out, coming out of Edwalton and forming up and they're obviously determined to defend Edwalton and make sure that the Royalists don't take the village. The Royalist officers are moving back up the hill towards the Royalist camp, Royalist regiment and the artillery, I'm sure, will start to withdraw soon. So, said earlier, ladies and gentlemen, what we're demonstrating here is the right flank of the Parliament Army. And uh, clearly what they're going to do is pose and push back the Royalists um, to make sure that they maintain control. You can see the Royalist pike are now um, marching back towards the rest of the Royalist Army. Try and get them up the corner. Mm. <coughs> They're going to fire down there. Chris, they're going to fire down there. Down there to the right. They're going to do it. So those uh, it's very clear that the Parliament Army are very well drilled. The uh, musket volley was extremely well controlled. And uh, I must say that if I was the Royalist like Army facing them, I would be somewhat concerned. I think it's fair to be said that they've completely underestimated the uh, numbers of forces stationed in the village. A very, very small scouting party was sent out the forlorn hope. concerned about attacking such an impregnable and strong force. Not too many pike at the moment, but uh, it would be typical for the parliamentarians to keep soldiers in reserve where they couldn't be seen, so that the royalists wouldn't know the full effect and the full battle um, regiments that they were going to have to fight against. But as you can see, quite a, 
large battle of muskets, large group of muskets down there. Well, one of the artillery, the Royalist artillery, they're still there and firing. Tessa, if I can interrupt you, I'm actually here with the gun captain of the injured crew. Are you dead, sir, or are you just badly stunned? My legs, are my legs still there? <laughs> yes, your legs, your legs are still there. Ah, I've got this. Oh, my stomach, my stomach's wet. Oh, the gun's blown up. Oh, we've had a musketeer at the ready box, and oh, I don't, I don't know how many of the crew, how many of the crew have we got? Is there anybody alive? None standing at the moment, sir. Oh, well, oh, I think you'll have to rely on yourself. Well, uh. Okay, they're obviously in really deep trouble here. I think we've lost at least one royalist gun crew, and all the others are at least. Badly wounded, but nobody's moving, I don't know. I'll come back to you in a minute. There's that colour. That's a big musket. Uh, the other one's over there. You don't do the big one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Wrong. There's people climb, going down the hill. Oh, they are, look. <laughs> yes, they are. What? There's people down there. Alright. Not to be there. There's people going down there. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand there are members of the public on the battlefield. Because of our insurance requirements, I'm afraid we have to stop until those members of the public have been moved away yeah. from the battlefield. Um, I spoke to you earlier about the safety of these two blue ropes, absolutely vital. Our insurance does not permit us to carry on a battle while there are members of the public on the battlefield. So if the members of the public can hear me, I rather suspect they can't because unfortunately the loudspeakers don't go down there. We are working very hard to get them removed from the battlefield. But I'm afraid that there's nothing we can do for the moment until that yeah, is done. Yeah, there's a beggar. Yeah, the mum with the dog. Down there. Oh, I think we need to go down another one. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I can see Yeah? <laughs> oh, bear. Oh. Hey, now. I saw family Whilst you're waiting, can I tell you something about the different weapons that you'll see this afternoon? Yeah. You just noticed a volley of shots from the Royalist Army, uh, unless you were looking in the wrong direction and had your fingers in your ears. Uh, those were almost all fired from a gun known as a musket and the type of musket which is most commonly used is one known as a matchlock. Uh, it's a very simple gun in which you fill the uh, end of the barrel with gunpowder, put a ball down on top of it and fire the gunpowder by use of a smouldering uh, piece of rope which is known as the match. This obviously meant that soldiers had to carry uh, at least a yard of match around with them in order to last the battle. And one of the key elements of anybody trying to uh, attack a, an army was to get the match from the opponent's baggage train so that there was no way of uh, relieving them if they ran out. So that's the matchlock musket. It's about four feet long. Uh, it's a heavy beast. Its accuracy is reasonable up to about a hundred yards, but its uh, effectiveness is more in the volley than in the uh, single aimed shot. Although, if you are hit by one of the balls, which are three quarters of an inch in diameter, uh, you would know about it, and the chances are that if you weren't killed instantly, you would probably die from shock, or perhaps uh, later from gangrene. Uh, there was no medical facilities available in the 17th century, uh, until after the battle and then you attended if you were lucky by somebody who knew a bit about surgery but very little about the rudimentary 
uh, aspects of hygiene and um, various forms of cleaning out wounds. The other principal weapon that you'll see used today is a 16 to 18 foot long pole uh, shot with steel, so it has a steel point at the, uh, the business end, if you like, and this is known as the pike, and you probably have seen pubs around Britain called the pike and the musket, uh, and they are named after the two principal weapons of the 17th century. The pike at the time was made out of ash, uh, and it was tapered from about three quarters of the way uh, along it down to the pointed end. So it was about an inch and a half at the widest point, tapering down to about three quarters of an inch. The pipe that you will see today are all much larger and heavier than that uh, because we're actually not trying to kill one another. There's a woman over there. And then the cavalry is the third arm, uh, the third arm of the uh, forces on the battlefield that you see today will be the cavalry. Uh, there are two types of cavalry that you'll see on the field. The rather flamboyant royalists uh, who tend to look as if they're landed gentry and on the whole were at the early stages of the war. Uh, and the rather more um, carefully attired and protectively attired members of the, the parliament are, uh, cavalry whom you will see wearing mainly buff coats, large leather coats, which would certainly stop a sword cut and, and might well stop a, a pistol or a musket ball at distance. Uh, and usually a type of helmet known as a lobster pot, because the rear of the helmet has a, a tail rather like a lobster. And the fourth arm is the artillery, whom you've seen in action and indeed in front of us currently in inaction. Uh, they are probably going to be captured if they're not very careful um, and if they are, the chances are that they will be offered uh, an opportunity to fight for Parliament because most artillerymen, not all, but most, were mercenaries who fought for the side which paid them most. Now as the armies start to form up and prepare their battle lines, uh, I'll, I'll give you some peace for a few minutes. Cavalry, ladies and gentlemen, wearing the orange sashes. They've just come out from the woods and they're obviously um, here to back up and encourage the muskets. They're uh, getting a cheer from them and they're obviously always very welcome to support their own soldiers. Um, but the soldiers can be fairly vicious with the opposing cavalry side, as I believe you may well see a little bit later. Might be just a good time to point out to you, um, because Malcolm mentioned a little earlier about no medical support in the 17th century. Um, we do have medical support. We have the Field Not Medical Society, which is located in that large white tent at the bottom of the field. It's a team of professional nurses, doctors, surgeons who give their time to support the Field Not, so that if we do have um, the attacks on the battlefield, it doesn't happen often, but we have to be prepared. They are fully qualified to deal with any medical emergencies on the field. Of course, we have the Red Cross here today to deal with your medical emergencies, but the Field Not Medical Society will be dealing with any mishaps and medical emergencies that happen on the field. They do a sterling job, so we're very, very grateful to them for all the work that they do.
have to say that if I was a royalist, I would be very concerned about this large amount of parliamentarian army turned up in front of me. Every colour that you see represents a different regiment and the drummers, mass drummers of those regiments, fronted by their artillery. And, uh, I have to say, Tess, that if I was a parliamentarian, I would be just as worried because we've got much more people. <laughs> and I'm just going to go over there now. Well, it looks to me as though this, uh, these regiments is, the Man is Manchester's wing of the Parliament Army, formed up and ready to advance. So I think you'll begin very shortly, ladies and gentlemen, to see some real action.